Could we return to the Guyana Suriname Basin to look at updates on the Kawa One oil discovery? I say return to because uh, we've done two previous videos which are on the channel um, which is shown below and there should be links to the particular videos. They cover a lot of geology on Kawa and the Crab Dagu a discovery over in uh, Suriname and uh, a sort of a status of where the basin is up to. So we're going to have a look at Kawa 1, a little update there, and then we're going to um, move on and have a look at a high level overview of source rocks. And, and this is coming from a question that was asked in the comments below in our previous video. So Kawa 1, this was an interesting headline published on the 7th of March, and you can see CGX abandons first Guyana find outside Starbrook. Well, the article goes on, the plugging of the CGX well will be a setback to the government's hopes and you can kind of get the sense that this is a pretty surprised uh, reporter who thinks that this is terribly bad news, but it isn't and we'll try and explain why. So we need to understand perhaps what's different between an exploration well and an oil producer. Now here's a diagram here and essentially you drill a hole down to depth, you line it with, um, with, with steel casing um, perforations, um, then allow fluids to come into the well and we insert what's called a tubing um, where the oil actually just flows up inside that up to the surface. Now an exploration well and a production well I've got significant differences. The design life of a, an exploration well, well, it's it's really just for the one job, to get down to the total depth of the well and evaluate what fluids uh, and what rocks there are down there. A production well, well, its basis of design is 25-year life. Now, for exploration wells, in shallower water, you may have to, if you go away from a, a, an exploration well, you may have to put a buoys and, and a guard boat around there. Again, in shallow water for a production well, you might have to put an over-trawlable protective structure, a big metal frame, so that uh, the trawl boards of fishing vessels don't pull the, the wellhead um, over and collapse the well. So the casing, the metal casing that's run in these wells, for, for an exploration well, you try and minimize the number of casing strings and um, they are fit for purpose. Whereas in a production well, they tend to be kind of heavier, heavier duty, they've got to last longer. And the more expensive, it's all to do really with the metallurgy. And that's down to this sort of this point here that it's dependent on the pressure, temperature, fluid phase, oil, gas, water, or a combination of all three. And of course, composition. Whereas in an exploration well, it's not going to be exposed to corrosive uh, liquids for very long at all. Uh, location is another issue. Exploration wells are, are often drilled towards the crest of a structure, whereas when you're designing a field subsea layout, you're optimizing it so that the production wells are close to the facilities. So they're the basic differences. Producers tend to be a lot more expensive than exploration wells. And if you do go away and leave the well, suspend it as we say, you'd actually set uh, some cement plugs within the well and then you'd uh, remove most of the BOP and you'd, you'd, you'd make the well safe and then go away. And then of course you'd have to pay mobilization for a rig or a, a drill ship to come back to this location and then it would have to re-enter the well. On the way it has to uh, drill out those uh, those cement plugs. and. There was always an unknown as to what what would be underneath those plugs, whether pressure will have built up and whether there's actually sort of hydrocarbon fluid. So it's it's a tricky operation and it's a very expensive operation. It could cost up to, you know, anywhere between 30 and um, maybe 60 percent of the well cost to actually come back later. So what's happened here is that the operator, CGX Energy, has basically said, right, the clever thing to do here is just to walk away having completely finished the well off. So we have more information on Kawa. We know that it was plugged and abandoned safely, we say P&A in the industry, and that there was one lost time accident throughout the entire well operations, which is, is good performance. Obviously it would be better if there were none, but it's a huge operation involving hundreds of people over months through the planning and execution work. The well reached a total depth, or TD as, we, as it's called, at 6,577 metres. And it actually encountered some 61 metres of 
hydrocarbon bearing sandstones. Now those sandstones are all Cretaceous age, ranging from Maastrichtian down to Coniacian. And it said that there wasn't any MDT. Now, pause the video here if you want to understand a little more about what the MDT is. But uh, suffice to say, it's a tool to actually get fluid samples and also measure pressures. Very, very useful tool. And nor did it actually take any sidewall core samples. Now, the information that there is, is uh, rock cuttings and, of course, the uh, electric logs that were used to actually characterise uh, and measure the rocks at depth. We understand that the Santonian effectively is, is interpreted to be oil bearing. That's uh, what's found. But uh, ultimately, I'm sure there will be a, uh, an appraisal well with a, a drill stem test or, or some MDTs to absolutely confirm what the fluid quality of the hydrocarbon is. The final well cost, $141 million. And really, what you're left with is just the seabed, more or less as it was before any of the operation started. Now, what you get for your $141 million is just the data, just the data, the, those electric logs and the information and the knowledge that there is probably a significant oil accumulation at depth in the well. Now, on the subject of, of drilling, if you are looking to reduce well costs, today's sponsor is Fraser Well Management, a qualified well operator and a well management company which covers both the full life cycle of oil and gas wells onshore and offshore. In a previous video, there was a question about the source rock in the basin. And um, here's one thing, and that is where there is oil and gas, well, there has to be a source rock. That is that is a given. And looking at this section here, you can see this is the onshore or the coastal region here where we've got the Tamboreggio and Calcutta oil fields. And these two oil fields have, were discovered back in the early 1980s and contain over a billion barrels of oil in place. Now, it's obvious from the geometry of this basin that these oils in these fields must have come from down dip, must have come from somewhere basinwards out into the ocean. And uh, exactly where? Well, that's something that's been studied over a lot of time. And uh, you'll see today that um, we've got a certain amount of information. Some of it comes from some of the, the deep sea drilling projects or the, the ODP results back in 2004. And what that found was some excellent quality source rocks in these Cretaceous intervals here. Um, high total organic carbon levels and uh, very high hydrogen in index, which is a measure of just how potentially oily or oil prone the source rock is once it reaches maturity. Now here's the stratigraphy and we're actually looking at this interval here, this Chironian to Cenomanian Kanji formation. And these are black organic rich mudstones. Now they are the equivalent of La Luna in Venezuela, the Naparima interval found in Trinidad and in the South Atlantic basins you can see here we can look from eastern Brazil to the Tano Basin uh, offshore Ghana and then along the coast past Togo and Benin and we can see that within similar Cretaceous ages we see that there are source rocks developed in all of these countries and areas. Now the country itself it, it gets up to 500 meters thick it is a type 2 kerogen, and as we said, you know, TOC is a total organic carbon. is somewhere between 4 and 7% weight. Now, they are world-class source rocks. And really, uh, given this, we then just need to work out where they actually attain maturity and enter the oil and late oil mature uh, windows. And here's a map from a YPF study back in 2006 and it shows the uh, offshore region and, and here's the, the extent of where the, uh, the source rock is believed to have been thick, the, the oil kitchen as it's known. It was recognized as being potentially very, very large and uh, probably in the light of recent drilling um, results, this has been honed and finessed and probably reduced. It may not go quite as far uh, up the uh, onto the shelf as perhaps shown here, but uh, certainly it's sort of in the region where all of the discoveries have recently been made. And what we're going to be looking at in coming uh, editions of Trove News, uh, we're going to look at the next set of wells, and there's going to be twelve wells we expect drilled in the Starbrook block in. 2022. Four of those wells are actually currently drilling. 
And the Patwa one well, which sputtered back in January, if it's on schedule, should be at or about the target or TD any day now. We're going to be keeping a, a close watch on upcoming wells in the quarantine block. That's the CGX block with their way one um, well, which it's hoped will be spudded in the second half of uh, 2022. Any other wells in the region, if they come forward for drilling, uh, we'll certainly be monitoring those as well. I think in a future edition, we'll take a look at some of the stratigraphic variations. And, uh, and this is just a, an excerpt from our Trove database showing the regional interpretation. And we've got the lithostratigraphic and chronostratigraphic breakdowns for uh, Guyana, Suriname, French Guiana. Trinidad and Tobago uh, and even Venezuela in there. So if you like the video, please uh, hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and ring the bell if you want to be notified when the next release is out. If you want to get in touch, there's our details. Thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you back on our channel. Thank you.